nothing feels more affirming than being in like a mixed yoga space to talk about race, to talk about equity and diversity and like how we disrupt systems. And there being maybe one or a few other people who are not white or a few other people who are not straight in the space. And them saying to me after in a message or privately, like, thank you for coming into our studio and saying these things because I've wanted to say these things, but I'm the only black person or I'm the only queer person. And I don't have the capacity to work there or practice there or be in this community and also advocate for myself. So thank you for coming in and like giving language and making it very digestible. Yeah. So if you could, Kelly, just share with us a little bit about, you know, how you got to where you are right now. Yeah. Where am I? Um, (laughs) I, um, well, I'm a Black person, I'm a queer person, and I was raised in the American South, um, and I think that my first, like, introduction to yoga was, like, in my early 20s, and it wasn't a good introduction, so I, like, left with a story about the practice not being for me, um, and then in about 2009 or 10-ish, I opened a hair salon, I was a hairstylist for 15 years, and we decided to barter with one of our clients for privates for our staff. Um, in the studio or in the salon and in the end of it everybody stopped going to the privates but me and I recognize now in hindsight that I needed this practice to ground me for the work that I want to do and for the life that I want to have um and so I started practicing yoga I guess almost 12 years ago um in privates with another black woman who actually is the person who brought me to yoga bill for the first time and introduced me to Sasudananda and that particular lineage. Um, and at the time I lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, which is Catawba and Sugar E land. It's where I was born and raised. And there were no studios where there were even black women teaching there. It was mainly white folks teaching yoga and the studios were expensive at the times didn't work for me then. And at that time I didn't have children, like my calendar and time was really my own, but still it was just inaccessible. And on top of it, you know, as a hairstylist, I'm like talking with my clients every day. Some of my clients I see every week. So they're also noticing not only like a physical change in me, but just a energetic and I guess uh, mental change in me that I could only attribute to learning more about the philosophy of the practice and feeling really rooted in like the yamas and the niyamas and a lot of self-study and contemplative practices and meditation and when I would tell them like oh yeah you know I'm doing yoga or meditation they pretty much have the same story as me that there wasn't a practice for black people and they didn't want to go into studios and I decided to take a teacher training um my teacher that I was in private school was hosting their first teacher training and I signed up for training and then like two weeks later I found out that I was pregnant with my oldest child And so I tried to withdraw from the training. And then my teacher was like, just still do it and see what happens. So my teacher training, the very first weekend, I was eight and a half months pregnant. I gave birth the very next week um, after the first week of training. (laughs) And so uh, for a long time, and still my practice is very much connected to my journey as a parent. Um, It supported me through you know, pregnancies and births and also like complications and also like the grief of losing like parental figures and other people that are important. And, you know, now through three years of pandemic, um, but in that time period, um, I've always felt really connected to and rooted to, and I feel accountable to making the practice more accessible to people who are traditionally out, held out of the practice because they're undervalued or underestimated within like yoga's industrial corporate capitalist complex. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that grounds most of the work that I do um, in terms of like public teaching. I'm usually teaching around race and equity. Um, and also I help to form a nonprofit based in North Carolina that's focused on access to healing spaces, not just yoga, but like all types of healing spaces for black people. Um, and that takes up a lot of my time too, um, cause we do mutual aid and have programming that's free and 
try to work with other organizations that maybe aren't 501c3s to like fiscally support the work that they want to do um, in healing spaces. And yeah, I think I answered your question. That's how I got to where I am. <laughs> That's yeah, how I got there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Our lives, our life's journeys, like, gosh, yeah. it's, it's so much to even reflect on, on it and, and think about everything that that's happened. It, it kind of brought up this question. Actually, I'll ask you is like, how do you feel about like talking about yourself? <laughs> like, um, you know, like, how, do, how does that make you feel? Yeah. It's interesting to talk about yourself because you or I was raised to not um, like brag about yourself to like be humble and I think that there's merit in that and also I think that um, it's important for people who are not white people who are not straight people in bigger bodies to be proud of themselves for just like existing and um, thriving in situations that really are designed for us not to do well or thrive Um, you know like 2020 is the first year that I had to turn down work around race equity. And before that, I had to really like lobby to get people to include it in things. And while there are folks like Jay Miles and um, Jeevanon, Amber Carnes and other people, right, who had teacher trainings, who trusted me to bring that work, for the most part, I fought with people about it. And that to me... um, it connects to talking about myself because I don't want to be known for teaching movement or meditation. I don't desire to be known for anything. And also like, it feels more and more important for me to be clear with people that I love all humans and I want all humans to have what they need. And historically people who look like me or have similar identities to me and people who don't have similar identities to me don't have what they need. And I'm, I am not in the practice of centering those who are in power, particularly in yoga. Um, I want it to be disrupted. And so I'll talk about me and the work that I do as much as I can in spaces, um, particularly wellness spaces, because to me, um, like oppressive systems and the impact of white culture is most prevalent here in this practice. And people don't like to talk about it or address it. They just want to uphold the same standard that whether they can like consciously hold it or not, they are upholding a story that this practice is only available to a few people and everyone else. It's not their problem that they can't physically get into a space or afford it because of time or money um, or other resources or the fact that even if you have all the money and all the resources and you're well-practiced, you can still walk into a yoga studio it's still been my experience that I can still walk in and be undervalued, spoken to in a way that's not affirming or provides care and just outright harmed because of my identities. And that's it. And that reality is a reality that I don't really know other black people who practice yoga that haven't experienced it. I don't really know other queer people who practice yoga regularly who haven't experienced being harmed in yoga spaces. And for that reason, I'll talk about my work and keep doing this work for as long as I can. Mm. Not forever, mm. but for as long as I can. Does it give something back to you when you're an advocate, you know, in, in this way? Or do you feel more that it's kind of exhausting and draining, but you still need to do it anyway because it's just right. it's so important and it's necessary? I think before the pandemic, I felt like it was so necessary and like I had to do it. And while I still feel accountable to the folks that I feel accountable to, I know that I don't have to be doing this work and I won't be doing this work always. I might not be doing this work in six months or a year. And also um, it's a both and like I, nothing feels more affirming than being in like a mixed yoga space to talk about race, to talk about equity and diversity and like how we disrupt systems. And there being maybe one or a few other people who are not white or a few other people who are not straight in the space. And them saying to me after in a message or privately, like, 
thank you for coming into our studio and saying these things because I've wanted to say these things, but I'm the only black person or I'm the only queer person. And I don't have the capacity to work there or practice there or be in this community and also advocate for myself. So thank you for coming in and like giving language and making it very digestible for them, but still holding them accountable. What feels like complex or hard is that I don't personally hold the belief that people just don't know how oppression works. Um, I don't hold that belief at all. And so in some ways it cannot it can feel like a waste of my time to keep having the same conversation over and over again in so many different yoga spaces and nothing changed. And, you know, sometimes I think that people who don't have to necessarily deal with the immediate impact of oppression, because it's harming everybody, but those who sit closest to their perceived power they might think like, oh yeah, yoga's changed. Like there's black people on the cover of yoga journal. There's black people who make a lot of money from teaching yoga. Like things are equitable. And it's like, it's not because there's still people who are willing to pay $25 for a drop-in class and have on a hundred dollar leggings while down the street or below that studio, people literally don't have food to eat or place to live or clean water to drink. And they could never just come in here and benefit from this medicine. Right. And talking about that constantly all the time does wear on the spirit. Anybody who does this work that says like, oh, this doesn't impact me personally. Mm, I would softly push back and say, maybe you're not completely aware of all the ways that it is personally impacting you. But particularly like as a black woman, I say it when I'm teaching, like any one of these people who take these trainings or listen to a podcast that I'm on can, and they have rallied against me in some way because they don't agree with something that I said, have attacked my social media or sent me harmful messages, tried to keep me out of working in certain spaces. And I don't personally have any animosity and also my resources are tied up in doing this work. So when I teach a training and someone feels tender because I refer to white culture and they feel so connected to white culture that they feel attacked, not because I'm attacking them, but because they feel attacked. I do have to worry about the ramifications of what they might do, how they might navigate that. And I almost every time I leave a training, someone's going to have negative feedback about me just conveying information um, that made them uncomfortable. And in that way, it's like, there are many other spaces inside and outside of yoga where I don't have to do this type of fighting, where we're all in the agreement that there's work to be done and we all have different parts to play. And so it sometimes feels like, and I'll just say, <laughs> this is my first interview saying it like, I'm tired of doing this work, honestly. And my resources are tied up in it. So I'll be doing it for a little while longer, but I don't hold race and equity work, particularly in yoga, as a long-term career path for me at all, not even a little bit. It's just not the best use of my energy. I'm a great writer. I'm a great collage artist. I'm a great plant-based chef. I love riding bicycles. I love flowers, plants, hiking, <laughs> swimming. Like there are other things for me to be doing with my time besides explaining to people like the definition of racism and then arguing with them about whether or not racism is real. Like I, I do not <laughs> have the capacity to do that. You know what I'm saying? I, I have to be teaching, uh, you know, we talked about it before we started recording, like I'm parenting two people. I'm not parenting them alone, but my partner and I spend a lot of time teaching them about racism and culture, not because it's fun, but because it's going to impact their ability to exist it already impacts their ability to exist. So I don't have the privilege of not educating them, but also they're my children. So I have lots of time to explain things to them. Strangers though, who like to jump in my inbox. And I mean, like last week I got called a communist, which is fine. I don't have like, okay, a socialist and a hate monger and mm -hmm. all while doing my job, which it doesn't like, I didn't go to bed like, oh, no, they called me a name. But also it's like at the same time, I have people in my inbox saying, like, I need money for medicine. I need medicine, money for eye surgery. And it's like if the same people who had emailed me to be harmful had actually listened to what I said, perhaps they could have donated because they got time, obviously, to email me. <laughs> 
they could have donated towards our mutual aid fund and I wouldn't have to tell some of these people no. And that part is like a weird mix for me. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. that's where I'm at energetically around it. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that the system isn't working for anyone, which is mm -hmm. my perspective mm -hmm. as well. And, you know, I wonder about like, what, what is the missing piece here? Like between a person, maybe who has financial resources and mm -hmm. instead of using them to do something that might help another human, they're, you know, arguing with you or someone else or whatever yeah. it is. Why, why, why are they making that choice is, is kind of a question to me. So first, and, I don't know if they're yeah. making a choice. I don't even know. Yeah. Sometimes the way that, like, for instance, I recently taught in a teacher training. There was some harmful things being said. I had to, like, pull the person in, like, call them in over Zoom, like, you're being harmful. Um, I tried to take care of the other people in the room who might have been harmed by their comments, but it left, left a lasting impact. I was in the training for several days. People shared over the days. And after the time was over, like, that really hurt me or harmed me or made me feel this or that, whatever. And ultimately, the person who did the harm never made themselves available to be accountable to the other people. They wouldn't join any more of the sessions and ultimately left that training, which is their choice to do. And also they shared during that time that like they have a lot of access to resources and how they responded to what was happening, the things that they said. While I was a little surprised because I try to facilitate the space in a way that minimizes how harm can happen. I can't eliminate it, but I try to minimize it. So this is the first time in a long time that I had this type of thing happen in a training. In most ways, on a human to human level, I felt very compassionate towards them because I'm like, you feel triggered right now, not because of what I said, but because no one's made you have to question your goodness as a white person. And I'm making you question that. And that feels very uncomfortable. And because you're not using the tools that we set up, you're lashing out in this way. That's very familiar. It's always exactly the same. <laughs> it, like it's, I'm laughing because as a race equity educator and other people I know doing this similar work, we can pretty much tell you blow by blow what's going to happen, especially online. If someone does something harmful, they're going to double down. They're going to get people to back them up. They're going to say their black friend said that they're right. And then if people don't relent, they'll just erase everything. And then they'll go in your inbox or in your private messages and be sending you messages, blah, 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 blah. And then they'll try to go over you if you work for someone and message the school that you were working for, the teacher training that you were in to try to like get you in trouble, I guess, or get you fired. I'm saying all that to say. I don't know if they have a choice. I think that the story about not enough, like not enough of anything is so deeply embedded in everyone, but particularly those closest to power that they continue to grasp at it in a way that is for me baffling and also understandable of like, oh, so the story is the more money you have, the more valuable you are. We all have to navigate that story. Some of us have done work to release that but most people hold that story. That's why if your checking account balance is low, you feel bad because then you're internalizing the story that like, oh, I didn't plan correctly or work hard enough or save efficiently or make the choices. And that's why I'm in this situation. And it's like, no, you're in this situation because that's how this monetary system is designed to work, to keep you in this perpetual drive to get things. And I think the closer people get to like immense wealth, that story is even deeper because yeah. like for me, I've never had a mess well. So my whole value can't be wrapped up in how much money I had because I've never had lots and lots of money. But if you've spent most of your life believing that and working really hard in that narrative. Yeah, you might think I'm a communist when I say you need to redistribute your resources. But it, it's like I, I don't even like blame like the person who called me a communist in this training that I was leading. It was literally about how we make sure everyone has food. That's what their group is working on. I was brought in to help support that work. And they literally said the idea that I was saying that everyone should have food is un-American. And it's like, well, I, I don't want to be in the group that says everyone mm. doesn't deserve food. If that makes me confidence, okay. I, I think all humans deserve food. It's a biological need that all humans have. But we're all upholding a system that says like, unless you work a certain way, and a certain amount and have a certain amount of money and other resources like time, 
vehicle transportation proximity, then you deserve food. Otherwise, you don't. And the same is true for yoga. So I don't know how to, I don't know what will be the thing that would wake people up. I was hoping it would be the last three years. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's what I'm interested <laughs> in too. Like what is actually going to motivate someone to change, right? And, you know, I th so I think about m this, what you're talking about in terms of money and, and, and um, putting your value in the amount of money that you have in, in life. And one thing that occurred to me at some point is that you know, maybe people are so stuck on that because it's so simple. Like it's so simple to see, you know, large numbers in your bank account and think, oh, I'm doing well. I'm winning at this life thing. But the truth is, right, it's like that's only one small part of a much more expansive thing. And yeah. and that's reality as far yeah. as I could tell. Like that's that's yeah. the reality of, of of how we live. And what what I feel that that has the potential to really motivate people is being aware that doing good deeds is pleasing to your heart. Mm -hmm. Right? Like if you're not doing good for other people in your day-to-day -day life, if you don't feel like you're being of service, like karma yogi, then you're not winning <laughs> yeah, yeah. on a very, on a very basic level. So it's like, yeah. what are the motivation factors to me? It's like uh, someone feeling guilty or shame or something like that about their situation, having more, like, that's never going to do the motivation, but the motivation that like you have an opportunity because of your position to do something that's going to please your heart. And you're going to go to sleep at night thinking like, Oh, wow. Like I lived a day. I think that might have the potential. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's two things that I would want to add on to what you said. It's like something I try to hold on a day-to-day -day basis is like, okay, how can everyone involved in this moment thrive? And if I can ensure that I'm doing what I can, for your thriving, right? We're on this Zoom call together. It's not beneficial for me to come on here and have an attitude with you or be nasty to you. I want you to do well today on this call and whatever else you have ahead. And so if I align myself with your thriving and everybody else is thriving around me, what I know is that everything around me, all the people around me will also be invested in my thriving. But there's this individualism that's a part of the culture that we're in that pervades yoga also, where people feel like, well, if I make sure you're thriving, then I won't have what I need. And it's not actually true. And scarcity. the other thing, yeah, a lot of scarcity. The other thing I would push back around is shame and guilt. Um, I think that my viewpoint around shame and guilt can be uncomfortable for people. I actually like to activate people's guilt and shame. It's a big indicator, just like anger, of misalignment and not respected boundaries. And so it's like, when I'm talking to people about, you know, Black people's ability to exist, to go to church, to go to the grocery store, to go to school and not be um, the victims of physical violence, emotional violence, energetic violence, because these all three things happen. And sometimes people are like, well, are you sure that was racism? And it's like... I've been black for 42 years. I'm pretty sure it's racism. I wouldn't just invent racism. There's no benefit to black people to name something as racist. Like it, nothing ever happens beneficial to us for doing that, which is why we often just don't say anything and just deal with it. But if I am talking to you about that and you feel guilt or you feel shame, it's like, what is the work that you, I'm not saying you, but anyone, who has a mindfulness practice, a yoga practice, what is the work you need to do to build your capacity to not only recognize shame and guilt rising, but to be with it as an indicator of misalignment and then use it as fuel to change how you show up in the world. But what often happens is we all, and this is the part about oppression hurting everyone, we all are in a system that says you can't be your whole self. There are certain times for you to be certain things and depending on your identities, there's no time for you to be a certain thing. So like I'm raising people that were assigned male at birth. 
I spent a lot of time talking to them about the complexity of their emotions and the importance of them being able to name and articulate them and talk about them and cry and like be upset, but to not use that as a form of aggression because so, so culturally they're going to be told that they really shouldn't be crying and whatever they feel can just be transmuted and articulated as aggression. And that's acceptable for them in that gender. I, of course, don't know who they're going to grow up to be and being able to talk about and express your feelings is important, but it's like the massive amount of domestic violence that occurs in the United States is the result of patriarchy. And patriarchy says that male identified people can't really talk about their feelings. I'm not giving people an excuse to be violent with their partners. And also I can imagine that if you spend your whole life internally ingesting all of your feelings with no real outlet to talk about who you are, to be your whole self or to skip or to be extra joyful or to wear pink or whatever it is, you're like segmented in a way that we're all experiencing. And so when people feel guilt or shame, there's a story that this is bad. I should not be feeling it. What can I do to get myself out of feeling that thing? And to me, that's when I end up getting an email or a nasty message because it's like, how dare you, Kelly, make me feel ashamed? And I often have to say to people in real time and email, I didn't make you feel ashamed. I don't control your feelings. We were having a conversation and those feelings came up for you. And as a yogi, because this is mainly yogi people that I'm talking to, you got to do some self-study about why you feel ashamed. Mm. I certainly have things that I feel ashamed about that I've said or done. And, you know, like I, I have books that are published. I hate that they're published through Amazon. And also that's the most efficient way for me as a self-publisher to be able to publish a book and it not bankrupt me to do so. But also Jeff Bezos is sitting on trillions of dollars while people don't have food or water or a place to live. And I don't want to be contributing to his, um, you know, <laughs> hoarding, but I am, we all are uh, in different ways. And yeah, I, I just think it, it, it would be better if people knew they could be whole because then they would have more capacity to say like, oh, I have lots of money and I feel guilty about that. This doesn't make me a bad person, but it does highlight the fact that I bought a story that harms others. How will I change now? Yes. See, I, I, what I feel that you just said is so important is the wholeness. This is a sense of wholeness. Like how great would it be if we all just accept I'm a human being having a human experience. And therefore, if I feel guilt or shame, that doesn't mean my whole self, sense of self-worth needs to crumble. Those are just indicators for me to redirect my life, you know, and regret is not going to achieve anything aside from, again, learning from an experience that could affect my potential future. But it seems like human beings have this tendency of like getting caught in the past where it's it's not serving us right like yeah. can we put the past where it in belongs and move forward perception. yeah we're, we're also caught in other people's perceptions of our past right and like I think for myself um like I shared I'm a core person but I only came out to my family four years ago and it wasn't really like a choice I didn't like say to my family like hey let's sit down I want to tell you a thing someone sent a text message to my family and told them and it in many ways imploded my life. And even at that moment, I felt like, okay, this is happening and I don't like how it's happening. It doesn't feel good. It brings up a lot of shame about like lying to my family about who I was for my entire life. And also like, I've had to do a lot of self-study to sit with that shame and say like, I can feel ashamed about it. I can have guilt about it. I can regret decisions I've made while like navigating that space. And it's data for me that for the rest of my life, I'm not doing that. I'm never doing that again. I'm not going to be a smaller version or a co-opted version or a more acceptable version of myself. I'm going to be my whole self. And I think that what, what gives me hope in a whole cesspool of hopelessness <laughs> around certain things, and particularly in yoga, is like this practice is magically designed to give you all the tools that you need to live in right relationship on this earth. The complication is that we live in a system that does not want us in right, right relationship with ourselves or anything else. And so can we just commit to that? I'm not even super concerned with you like taking a course from me and then donating a million dollars. If you got it to give, fantastic. 
And also I'm more concerned with each of us doing exactly what you said. Be in your wholeness, because if you are in your wholeness, you cannot disregard the wholeness of the planet or other people on this planet or any of the other things that are living and existing on this planet. The water, the land, the animals, the mushrooms like you can't ignore the wholeness of all of that when you are in your wholeness. And unfortunately, people, us, all of us are kind of caught between the story that our systems have created about what makes us valuable, important, right, good, and not our wholeness. And I want to be more in the practice of my own wholeness. And like when I'm facilitating spaces, I say it all the time. This is not about like, how do the people with money help the people without money? It's about like, how do we all get to be whole? And that means even the people who seem like they have everything, they don't. They bought a story that who they are is really tied in what they own, what they're wearing, what they're driving, where they're living, where their kids are educated, the vacations they take. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't enjoy the bountifulness of things, but there has to be a, I don't want to sound too like do me, but there has to be a reckoning. This isn't sustainable. No. <laughs> I mean, I think they said we have seven more years before the planet is at an irreversible place. And I'm just like, for myself, and you might feel this too, like my children won't even be adults in seven years. So speaking of children, you know, it's like, I, to me, I think I have the tendency of wanting to be like a, a detective with my analytical mind, right? So like take where we are, where we are with, uh, maybe the majority of human beings not feeling a sense of wholeness, right? Mm-hmm. And then asking the question, you know, well, how did that come to be? You know, with trying to look at the situation as objectively as possible without getting mm-hmm. angry, maybe because not because anger is wrong, but because I noticed that that would that would skew my vision, and I want to see clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, and what what I come to, obviously, there's many many factors, mm-hmm. but. I'm kind of astounded. I want to ask you about this, that there isn't more conversation around education because to me, the education is like, that is clearly when I think about how I spent my days as a child and how other people are spending it, like there's a clear uh, linking there between a lack of a sense of wholeness and the way that I had to spend my days as, as a child. It was literally like, you are not whole the way that you are. You need to prove yourself. You need to study. You need to intake this information and then you need to perform and you need to compete against your fellow classmates getting into what you're talking about with the competition and not realizing right. that we are all together, which is, I think, maybe the biggest issue that we have. So mm-hmm. it's like, I just want to ask you about that. And what's right. your what's your perspective yeah. on the education system? Um, <laughs> so I have some strong views about education. And I want to start by saying that I come from educators. So I was raised by a librarian and a history major. Um, most of my relatives have worked in education in some way. My grandmother was a teacher, mm-hmm. like, yeah, education is a big part of how I was raised. And I think part of that is the the lie of segregation and integration that if we as Black people perform well in school, vote, become good citizens of the United States, and I'm talking about like Black folks in America, um, then we, there's no limit now that integration has occurred. And I definitely have benefited from my parents both going to college and getting what would be good jobs and having access to resources that in particular, my mother didn't grow up with access to. She grew up in a very rural place and they didn't have access to the same things. Plus, you know, different time periods. My parents were being raised in the fifties and sixties or being raised in the eighties and nineties. And still I don't have faith in a public or popular education model um, that is here in the U S I think that I started to lose faith in it when I was in school, um, just because I had people in my life, grandparents, my parents, other people in my community, countering what I was being taught in school. When I would have assignments, when I would share what I was learning, um, I remember the first time my grandfather said to me, like, the teachers are lying to you. And he was like, they're not doing it on purpose. They're teaching you from a curriculum, probably based on what they also have learned and also like 
history belongs to the victors or the perceived victors. And so the history that you're receiving is not accurate. It's not real. Um, integration was not helpful to Black people was, was the conversation that we were having. And hearing from my parents who were children during the beginning of the civil rights movement and like my mom who wasn't in an integrated school until she was 17 years old um, and her parents sharing like integration actually decimated us financially. We were better off when we were segregated and our, we could pool our money mm -hmm. and circulate it through our community. And so like I've always grown up kind of questioning what was being said at school or in books or in movies and all of that. When you add the layer of becoming a parent, um, I started watching things like a documentary called Class Dismissed. And while I don't appreciate that it's not diverse, it was a documentary about the different ways that people are choosing to school their children in the United States that are outside the popular education model. And so my own children are not in a popular education model. They were kind of homeschooled already before the pandemic with the combination of like some learning communities. And while they are going to go to a more traditional school setting next year, what you speak about to me isn't a coincidence. It's like, there's a reason why school is designed the way that it is. Literally someone went over to Europe to visualize how they were creating these massive and powerful work uh, forces. And they brought that schooling back to the U.S. And I often feel like, yeah, I went through that education model also. And I can name some of the harms that come from that. And also, I think most people are never going to question it. And if you do, they feel like you're attacking teachers or they feel like you're attacking them for choosing that for themselves or their children. And I'm not. There aren't a lot of options for people, even for myself, selecting something outside of normal, whatever that means, is hard. It's really complex work. I mean, part of the reason why my children are going to go to a school system um, next year is because my partner and I need a break from three years of full-time working and full-time homeschooling. And we feel like we've laid some foundational things with our six and eight-year-old that in a school setting, they could navigate and we can supplement and educate them because um, they're learning all the time. But, you know, this central authority figure who's at the front that you don't question, who teaches you things from a very like, this is how it is. These are the facts. You got like large government bodies in many states controlling what children are learning and how they are learning. And to me, the systems that are in place to control all of us are first introduced to us through school, <laughs> even through like Sesame Street. And like, I, I think I was probably like a teenager when my grandpa told me like, I don't like Sesame Street, but I didn't like to say anything because it was like the only educational program that had black kids and brown kids on it for you to watch. But like, look how they treat Oscar the Grouch. Like, this is a story about people's value and worth. He lives in a trash can and he's grumpy. And so everybody treats him kind of like, subpar to how they treat like big bird and my grandpa was like this is not a coincidence they are implementing into you already a story that some people are valuable and other people are not and I appreciate my grandfather and my parents and other people in my community for helping me to question that but also you know school created a story that the purpose of my adult life is working and that's a lie so I'm trying to like teach my children that of like the purpose of you growing up is not for you to work <laughs> If you choose to work as a grown up, that's wonderful. And I hope you select something that makes the world a better place, whether it's art or music or being a teacher or whatever, a farmer, whatever. Like, I hope you pick something that makes the world a better place. But the purpose of you growing up is to continue like learning and growing and having experiences and being of service to the world around you. And I see some schools kind of like moving in that direction. But I'll just say as a parent, even in trying to find schools next year, it was just like, I don't want my kids to learn that. Or like they've been doing a lot of on, online learning through like OutSchool and these other like learning sites. And it's been great because they can learn from teachers from other places. But it's like, 
I can't trust someone else to teach my children about money because they're going to impart a story of value that I don't wish for them to hold. So I can teach them that money is a system of counting and trading and bartering. And this is what a dollar's worth. And this is what a quarter's worth and all of that. And also it's all made up and it means nothing. And I hope that you don't have to navigate it when you're an adult, but most schools are not going to teach that. And I feel like that's really important for those of us who are parenting. Parenting is a form of activism too. And it's like, for those of us Mm -hmm. connected to envisioning a reality where everyone can exist, we won't be able to keep sending our children to the schools that states have set up, even private schools, because they're all upholding a story that doesn't, for me at least, align with how I wish for the world to be when they're adults. I know it won't even be that way when they're adults. So perhaps if humans still exist, maybe in like 10 or 15 generations, things would be different. But like, why do we pay for food? I'm not going to keep teaching my children that that's normal or right. We talk about it every time we're in the grocery store. It's ridiculous that we have had to work for food and water because we know, like I'll say to them, like, what are the basic things that humans need? And they'll say like shelter, water, food, care. And I'm like, exactly. Why do we have to pay for all? We have to pay for every single one of those things. Who benefits? Not the people. And like they can grasp it at six or eight, but I don't know if that would be true if they go to school for 10 more years, you know? So interesting. Yeah, I remember hearing you talk about this and I and I love it. Just, I think just the activity of asking that question, what are basic needs for human beings? Like, what what are they? You know, what mm-hmm. what what do I feel every person person should be entitled to. This is an amazing practice, I think, Mm -hmm. to do that. And, uh, and then can we, can we supply it? And then also what is the effect of people not having those things, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the, the, the pyramid Maslow's pyramid of, of hierarchy. If if my basic Mm -hmm. needs are not going to be met, then I'm probably not going to be as healthy of a human being. And therefore what I do is not going to be as good. And it's going to affect all of us. Like one of the basic, I think, um, non-realities, right? Is this that we are not all connected to each other? Like, that's a fundamental question. Like, are we all connected to each other? If yes, then why wouldn't I want everyone to have their basic needs met so that they can, it's just, it's so silly. Like the misconception, you know, it's so clearly out of, out of fear. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think too, it's like people aren't being, let me not say people are, It is regular practice for us not to have to think about it, for us to not even have the space to think about it. And I think that um, I hate the last three years that we've navigated because it's meant a lot of loss for so many people, myself included. And also, I think I was hopeful that people would have enough time and space away from what had been normalized to say like, oh, like, that is not in alignment. And I think that a lot of people that I personally know or in community with did come to that place. And also things are back to normal. So it, it critical mass didn't make that choice. You know what I mean? A critical mass of us didn't say like, this is not how I want to be existing or living. And I think, um, again, it comes back to that wholeness of like in supporting people during this time, people, a lot of people said to me like, well, I don't know who I am if I don't go to work or like, Mm. I don't know who, who, how can the holidays be special if we can't spend lots and lots of money and throw big parties. And it's Mm. like, this is an opportunity for us to think about a different reality and what it brought to my forefront awareness. Cause I'm sure other people were aware of it. And I just wasn't, is that like, the oppressive systems that we live in actually rob us of our ability to ima- our ability to imagine another way of being. And so like, what is the work of helping people just like vision a different reality, even if we're not all the way there. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Cause I like privately, I hold workshops like in my Patreon community for people to do that work. Like I'm going to host one tomorrow and we'll sit together for 90 minutes. We're going to talk about shame and the stories that we're holding around shame. We'll do a lot of contemplative writing, but the very end of it is like, we'll write a story, each of us about how we imagine navigating shame when it comes up without thinking about like time or resource constraints. And what I'll say for myself and like other people that I've 
been doing this type of work is like, we come to some realities that are like so far fetched. Like I'm working to a rea- towards a reality that five years ago, Kelly would have been like, girl, you crazy. But it <laughs> like in my own personal life, I'm like, I don't wish to work every day. I don't even wish to work every week. And that doesn't make me lazy. Previously, I would have been like, what's wrong with you? You're so lazy. You're supposed to work. But this time period helped me to see like, first, I don't need to work as much as I was because I don't need to spend as much as I was. And there are ways for me to be in the business, the business of making sure other people have what they need. That guarantees I always have what I need. It might not come to me in the way that I envisioned it or look the way that I wanted it to look. And also like, I, I could have had a very different three years financially and emotionally, except for the fact that I center community as the number one resource over money. And in that way, like the people I'm in community with, they always take care of me. They always do, whether it's checking in with me, hitting up my cash app, <laughs> promoting my work, sliding me opportunities, sending me a book, sending me a funny meme, like this is like the most important work that I did the whole time was to establish really Mm. authentic community with people all over the world. Some people I've never even met before and they ride for me. Like they've done a lot for me in three years, just based on us developing the type of community we could develop over Zooms and telephone calls and written letters. And I just... I want all of us to really be considering. I want to invite people like who told you that you had to be living the way that you're living and do you, does it actually benefit you? Does it benefit the world around you? Does it bring you into better relationship with yourself and the people that you care about? But also does it bring you into better relationship with all the people you don't know? All the things you can't see and um Yeah, being in that practice gives me hope, but also sometimes makes me feel really adrift, particularly Mm. in like yoga, because this is a capitalist industry and people are really focused still on how to use this metaphysical spiritual practice to be rich and the two things don't go together, but I don't really know how to get them to see that. Mm. That part feels like oh, well, maybe that's not my job to do. Maybe it's just my job to deal with the people who do see it. Does that make sense? Like, <laughs> Totally. I mean, it's like, right, like yeah. the capacities of the human mind. And I think also as you start to do these practices, you start to realize things on such a larger scale. But it's like, what can I, you know? And and in, especially with the injustice, I think, when you when you see it so yeah. clearly how unjust something is, it's like, I want to change this so, so badly. Uh, and then to just kind of move forward in a healthy way where you take actions that support change, but at the same time, don't like take the whole thing on the weight of your shoulder so that your sense of self-worth is, you know, dependent on it. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially how I, I, I I laugh about it with people, but I say to them like, okay, we're about to start this race equity work. I don't actually care what you do with this information. Like that I'm not in control of that. Like my own non-attachment practice has to be in place Mm -hmm. because it's not that I think I'm such an amazing facilitator. It's like the truth has a healing power. And so you knowing the truth, you can either choose to heal yourself or not. And I can't control that. And if I do that, if I teach a training to 300 people and then think the yoga industry is going to be changed, <laughs> even after now teaching thousands of people, it's like, I, I wouldn't feel good about myself because nothing has changed, but my self-worth isn't tied up in it anymore. And you know, I can feel myself um, releasing the work to the people who want to do it because I'm not really sure if I want to keep doing it. I, I'm, let me change that. I'm sure I don't want to keep doing it. I will, I, but yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. One final question that I really wanted to ask mm-hmm. you about because just the interactions that I've had with you so far, I feel that you're such a courageous person. And I think cur- <laughs> courage is more of what's, what's needed because we talk about like the change and how uncomfortable it is and how right. how safe humans tend to feel in what's known you know even when the known right. is like an abusive terrible situation i'm so yeah. scared of the unknown that i'm right. going to stay where i am right and, uh you really seem to me as a person that 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 has the courage to explore the unknown and explore the the different uh, different 
you know, path. And I'm wondering where does that come from for you? Um, I appreciate you saying it. I don't think I think about myself as courageous or that the work that I'm doing is brave. Uh, I think I just feel it as necessary. Um, like I said before, I definitely have, I grew up in a mostly white neighborhood. I went to mostly white schools my entire life, even college. And <clears throat> there are definitely times when I just did my work, kept my head down and tried to like, um, stand out without standing out, you know what I mean? Like academically stand out, but I'm not going to like try to stand out in other ways because, you know, I'm, I think that black people who are listening, a lot of us have the same story of like, you need to work twice as hard to acquire the things that your coworkers, classmates might achieve. And so you like really need to be focused. And while I do care about having shelter and resources for food and I feel responsible for the care of my children. I also just, I don't have the capacity to not name things that are wrong when I'm in a space. And I think that it has to do with how I was raised, but also where I am now as an adult of like, you know, like last week I quit something that I had a commitment. I don't even know what the long-term ramifications are going to be of me quitting it. And also like, they don't want to do the work they hired me to do. So why am I wasting my time and your time and your money? I could be doing something else. Do I even know what that something else is? I don't, but I'm just trusting that it'll present itself at the right time. That even if for some reason I don't like, I don't know, have enough money, the people who care for me, who I care for, are going to just leave me out in the cold. But I also like energetically my integrity around it was taking a hit like I didn't feel good about working with them or supporting the work that they were doing and I appreciate you saying it's courageous I just think of it as like it's necessary it's mm. it's not honest it's not honest to teach yoga and act like what's happening in the world doesn't impact what's happening on that because it is like I'm going to teach a movement class in a little while and like tens of people have died that didn't need to die just in the last week. And I can't assume that the people who are going to join me for that practice aren't impacted by that. Even if they don't know what they're impacted by, I'm impacted by it. And so like, I'm not going to not talk about it just because of like the bubble of like, you know, people say like, well, yoga is supposed to be like a, an escape. And I'm like, oh, for me, it's like, what makes it possible for me to engage? So I'm not escaping yeah. anything when I get onto yoga's a mat. Everything. Right. <laughs> it's it's like yoga is sitting on a, a boiling cauldron sometimes and like feeling the heat of your decisions and your feelings and your impact on the world, but also how the world is impacting you. And I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I'm going to take that in that you view me as courageous. I'm going to see if I can hold that. Oh, I mean, I think that, that, that I, <laughs> and I think it's beautiful what you said about you. I just feel that it's necessary. I mean, that, that just says it all right there. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's the answer that I'll take away. Kelly, thank you so much for taking this time. I really, I appreciate yeah. your time, your person, the work that you're doing. I'll just mention uh, that Kelly has a, an amazing Patreon where she's offering just wonderful services. We'll put in the show notes if you want to check that out. Um, and you are an artist, you know, that's what thank I feel you. is that you are. So thank you so much, thank my you. friend. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you. I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this content and think others might as well, please feel free to share and subscribe.